If you ever noticed wind turbines standing still on a windy day, I heard that wind farms are being paid not to generate. It seems bizarre, especially when electricity bills are sky high and wind power is one of the cheapest sources of energy. While some might be stopped due to maintenance, other times there's actually too much power being generated on the grid than we can use, or the network is constrained, so even if we need the power, we can't get it to where it's needed because the lines and cables to get it there are overloaded. This is where constraint payments come in, which is a payment made by the National Energy System Operator, or NASO, to whoever owns the generation asset, like a wind farm, because it's supposedly NASO's fault that there are constraints on the network, and the generator wants to get paid for the energy they could have generated, and can't. These payments are ultimately paid for by the consumers, like me and you, on our electricity bills, through the Balancing Services Use of Systems Charges, or BSUOS. Being asked to stop or reduce generation by NESO is what's known as curtailment, as you're deliberately curtailing or lowering your generation output. I'll explain how we calculate the payments later on when we talk about the numbers. So far this year, we've wasted roughly £1.23 billion on this issue. Of that, £650 million was on curtailment, and we're projected to hit £1.8 billion by total year end. It's nothing new. In 2023, the UK paid out around £715 million in constraint costs, with over £500 million going to wind farms in Scotland, highlighting the north-south bottleneck in our grid. That works out to roughly £40 on the average household bill. But constraint payments aren't the only part of the cost. We still need the electricity those turbines would have produced, so something else has to fill in the gaps. In 2025 so far, 1.23 billion has been spent on managing this problem. Nearly 650 million of that went to wind farms to switch off, and the rest, potentially more, went to gas and other conventional generation to switch on and make up the shortfall. We're paying twice once to waste the clean energy and again to burn fossil fuels instead. And here's the next banana peel on the stairs. Whenever gas is running, it often sets the wholesale market price for electricity that day. That means even the cheap renewable power we do use gets sold at gas prices, making bills higher for everyone. And another point just to explain why gas sets the price is the UK system known as pay as clear. And simply put, means the most expensive generator that bids in that half an hour period sets the price for all generators. That would mean that the cheap renewables also get that high price for their cheap power, making wild profits. However, most renewables these days work under the Contracts for Difference model, or CFD. Under a CFD, the generator agrees to a fixed strike price for every megawatt hour they produce. If the market price is lower than the strike price, the government tops them up. But if the market price is higher, they have to pay the difference back and that money should flow back to reduce consumer bills. Older wind farms and merchant generators without CFDs do still pocket those higher wholesale prices, which is why you sometimes hear accusations of profiteering. But overall, CFDs are now the backbone of how we bring cheap renewable power onto the grid at stable prices. So when you hear the phrase, gas sets the price of all energy, this is what that means, and why firing up gas at peak times it's not just bad for emissions, but it's also bad for bills. CFDs are great for consumer bills, and in an 18 month period between 2021 and 2023, wind farms paid back £660 million to consumers during the gas crisis, which is about £30 off your energy bill. But they're not without criticism, as some wind farm developers, the people who build them, say the strike price can be too low, and an example of that was in 2023, with allocation round 5, where the government sells off land leases for wind projects and they fail to get a single bid for offshore wind at the £60 per megawatt hour strike price. Developers accused the government of trying to prove renewables were cheap by setting the price lower than they could afford. CFDs only account for a small amount of inflation, and when the price of steel, components, labour and interest on borrowing go up too fast, developers are left at a loss and have paused or cancelled some high profile projects like Norfolk Boreas, which was part of allocation round 4, and just recently Hornsea 4 which is part of allocation round 6, which has been put on hold for rising costs. Critics of renewables often cite CFDs as a hidden subsidy that is unfair since it guarantees renewables revenue when gas and nuclear rely on wholesale costs. However, the reason is clearly to encourage investment by giving developers certainty, and we're not trying to encourage fossil fuel development, so that just makes sense to me. 
And if we didn't have fossil fuels, then maybe renewables could be more competitive with each other. An example of that encouragement you can see now is tidal and floating wind, which have a very high strike price, but very low megawatt output, which is similar to the first round of CFDs, which also had a high strike price to encourage the changeover from renewable obligations to previous subsidy. I'll explain the true cost of renewables and all these mechanisms in a future video. I don't want to sound like an eco-terrorist again, as one comment I put it. But fossil fuel generators have been paid £12.5 billion since 2015 just to be on standby to secure the energy supply. And that was levied right onto consumer bills and will be there until 2040. And nuclear isn't off the hook either, as Hinkley Point C just got their own CFD strike price of £92.5 per megawatt hour or about £120 in today's money. Much higher than wind CFDs that average about £86 since CFDs started. But I do agree, at least it can provide stable base load power when it's finished. To put it plainly, every form of energy gets some sort of subsidy or support for a reason. And some recent wind farms have forgone the CFD scheme and subsidies altogether. Now we know more about how the price of energy is set. How do we work out what to pay a generator to curtail its generation? Using the balance and services mechanism I mentioned at the start, an ASO will ask a generator how much it will cost them to reduce generation by a certain amount and the generator will submit a bid at that price. For example, if a wind farm is putting out 100 megawatts of power and an ASO needs them to reduce generation by 50 megawatts and that original 100 megawatt had a wholesale bid price of 40 pounds to keep the math simple, but the wind farm had a strike price of 60 pounds, so we're receiving a subsidy of 20 pounds per megawatt hour extra they would put a bid in for the full £60 to cover all their lost revenue. So the wind farm would keep generating at 50 megawatts and get paid for that, but they'd cut their generation by 50 megawatts as well and get paid by the NASO for helping balance the grid and not lose out on any money they would have otherwise earned. So how did all this come about? Well, in the government's push to get 50 gigawatts of wind energy connected to the grid by 2030, there was a scramble to build wind power anywhere possible as quickly as possible and worry about actually using the power later. So we had lots of wind popping up in Scotland and grid investment hadn't caught up yet to actually get that power to the people who needed it. Pages five and six of the electricity 10 year statement produced by the NESO show the projected constraints up to 2030 particularly across the north of England. The biggest bottleneck up here is actually B5 boundary across the Scottish Midlands near Edinburgh and Glasgow, which has a 3.9 gigawatt limit due to thermal constraints on the Denny to North Lamhill 275 kV circuit. As it crosses the border from Scottish power to National Grid, we get a 6.7 gigawatt thermal constraint on the Harcourt and Moffat 400 kV circuit. Thermal constraints are essentially current limits, and I'll go over what we do to help that in a moment. Before I go through the solution though, Leave a comment down below what you think is key to bringing down the cost of electricity. So what is the answer? Well, the transmission operators, National Grid, SSEN and SPEN, are investing heavily to upgrade the network to increase capacity. In Scotland, this is mostly upgrading from the original 132 kV and some 275 kV up to 400 kV, which would help that thermal constraint on the B5 boundary I just mentioned. The transmission operators of Great Britain are also partnering on the Eastern Greenlink projects, which I'm working on now, and Western Link 2 to offer an alternative path down south to where the demand is. And National Grid also have the Great Grid upgrade, which will reinforce the network for better connecting up renewable generation, and more on that in a future video. If you're wondering why we want to take power from the north to south, Scotland produces around 30 terawatt hours of electricity per year, mostly from renewable sources like wind, and consumes only around 15 terawatt hours of energy, so can be exporting up to half of what they produce. As well as these massive projects, there's also a rollout of new technology and innovation to help better use the lines we have, like dynamic line rating, which lets us monitor the real time temperature of a line so we can get extra capacity out of it, rather than relying on assumptions from the data sheet and weather forecasts. Currently, we just sort of guess by taking the ambient temperature from the weather forecast, how much power is flowing through the line and how much we think it sags based on those two things and the material data sheet. Sag is exactly what it sounds like. And when you have an overhead line stretched between two towers and it heats up, it starts to bend down. And that's what sag is. If you imagine the table is a road, you don't want it hitting too low down, otherwise you get a zap. So we need to carefully calculate what the sag will be so that we keep it at a reasonable level and doesn't harm anyone. Why is temperature important? Well, the more current we send down the lines, the hotter they get due to dual heating or I squared R losses, meaning your current multiplies by itself, 
then by the resistance of the line. So current has a major impact on losses and that creates this quadratic graph. That heat causes the metal conductors to expand and the lines to sag. If they sag too much, they could become a danger to things below like cars on motorways, trees and whatever else is under lines which has been a cause of forest fires in some places if the vegetation isn't cut back on a regular basis. Another technology being tried on the grid to increase the capacity of lines are high temperature, low sag conductors, which as the name implies, lets us run the conductors at a higher temperature, meaning more power can flow. These are just some of the things being done to upgrade and reinforce our network to use the power we already generate more efficiently. As always, I'll dive into some of these concepts and technologies more in future videos, but this was a quick stop so you hopefully understand wind curtailment and constraints, why and what's being done about it, and as always, if you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe for more electrical content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. If you're interested in more industrial history and technical content, like, subscribe and let me know down below what else you want me to cover. If you want to support me directly and have a bigger say in what videos I work on next, check out my Patreon link in the description and thanks to my patrons Benedict, Andrew, Jack, Lionel, Richard, TJ, Colin, Mr Bear, Tim Small, Nils and James. Have you ever wondered? Boy. Can't help yourself. And why firing up gas at peak times is not just bad for the climate, but it's also bad for your bills. Okay. Yeah. There's one behind as well. Oops. CFDs are great for consumer bills. Go a few more, come on. A few more, please. Just have a sit. During the gra grass crisis, no. CFDs are great for consumer bills, and in an 18 month period between 2021 and 2023, wind farms paid back £660 million to eat half, eat half, and then you can have a lolly, okay? Like Norfolk. Norfolk, what am I, American? A nuclear isn't off the foot. Foot hook. Apologies. And here it comes. Oh, money. Oh, front and centre for this fun. Hmm. Oh, I forgot my soundproofing. I'll do that really quick. Cat, can you not be fucking making noise, mate? Yeah. Psst. What are you eating? Eat a fan. Sounds like there. Nice.